Hello, psychology class. I want to give you a little help with the test because I think that learning about behaviorism is hard when it's just through the textbook. And so I'm going to go over some of the terms for you. I do want to start with John Watson. And John Watson, of course, was the researcher who worked with little Albert. He is considered the founder of behaviorism. Uh, John Watson has sort of a mixed reputation. He did contribute greatly to the field of psychology. The experiments that he did with little Albert would not be allowed today. He basically terrorized the child and taught the child to have a phobia for anything white and furry. Obviously, that's not desirable for mental health, but back in the day, we didn't have the regulations on human research that we have now. So the terms. We begin with a neutral stimulus. Poor little Albert. When he was a tiny tot, if he saw a cute white bunny rabbit, he wasn't the least bit afraid. But John Watson made a really big loud sound every time a white rat was presented to little Albert or a white bunny rabbit. And pretty soon little Albert associated the sound of the noise with the appearance of the white animal. The noise is an unconditioned stimulus. Unconditioned means unlearned. Think of the word conditioning as learning. Nobody teaches a baby to be afraid of a loud sound. We are afraid of loud noises. That is part of our survival technique. It's come through our evolution. So John Watson paired the sound of the booming. He, he used all kinds of things to make noises. He um, would clap his hands loudly. Uh, uh, have a gong, anything to startle the baby. And the unconditioned stimulus of the sound caused the crying. The furry white animal started out as a neutral stimulus. It didn't cause any kind of reaction at all. And then eventually, every time a bunny rabbit or a white rat appeared, little Albert would cry like crazy because he had learned to associate. Now, the white rabbit was not neutral anymore. It was a conditioned stimulus. He had learned to attach a meaning to it. Likewise, if we go back to Pavlov's dogs, a bell ringing for a dog isn't going to elicit much of a reaction. It's neutral, neutral stimulus. Meat, however, will excite a dog. They don't have to be taught. In conditioning, classical conditioning, you work with an unconditioned stimulus that is biological. It is not voluntary. The dog doesn't choose to salivate. He just does. And then the ringing of the bell, the neutral stimulus, is paired with the unconditioned stimulus and learning starts to occur and there is a transformation. What used to be neutral is now meaningful. The bell has converted from a neutral stimulus to a conditioned stimulus. When the dog salivates to the sound of the bell, that is a conditioned response. Learning has occurred. Then we get into some of these terms. Positive reinforcement is going to strengthen a behavior. If you get an A on a test because you studied, that's positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement also strengthens a behavior. Many people get confused. Negative, they think that means bad. But in this sense, positive means a plus sign, like in math, and negative means a minus sign. Here's an example. Everybody I assume you've all had this experience. You get in the car, you turn on the ignition, and then ding, 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 ding. Got to put your seatbelt on. Ding, 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 ding. Maybe you're in a hurry. It's pain in the butt. I don't want to put my seatbelt on. Ding, ding, ding. You have to put your seatbelt on. And what happens? Voila. No more ding, ding, which is so very annoying. You just got negatively reinforced. You got negatively reinforced to put on your seatbelt to make the sound go away. Punishment is different from negative reinforcement. Punishment extinguishes a behavior. And so an example I'd like to use is my cat, Katie Kitty, a very annoying creature. And Katie used to hang on the screen door. She'd hang on the screen door to get in. <laughs> She'd rip the screen. And I thought, enough of that. I got a spray bottle full of water. And when she would hang on the screen, psh, psh, I'd spray her in the face. Yep. And she would drop off the screen, run away, 
pretty soon she didn't hang on the screen anymore, right? Her behavior was extinguished by punishment. I punished her. It, it's, um, it was not negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement often happen at the same time. So picture the scenario. We've got the baby in the carriage. Let's say we've got a three-year-old and she wants candy. Mommy want candy. Mommy want candy. We don't need to buy candy, mom says. Baby girl keeps continuing. Mommy want candy. And the mother's finally, oh, all right, one candy. And she buys the child a candy. So who got reinforced? We have positive reinforcement and we have negative reinforcement. What got taken away? The sound of the child nagging. Mom just got reinforced because that racket stopped when she performed the behavior of buying the candy. Little girl got reinforced positively, plus sign. She got a candy. And so that's how it goes. These patterns develop. All right, I'm going to glance at my notes here, and I don't want to make this video too long. But you have several terms that you need to be reviewing. They are on your review sheet. I did want to talk to you about conditioning a little bit because I think it can be very confusing. I hope that this helped. All right. Oh, the last thing I want to talk to you about are the schedules of reinforcement. You've got four words to learn here. You have the word fixed. That means it doesn't change. You have the word variable. That means it changes. The other two words are ratio. When we are talking about schedules of reinforcement, ratio means actions that you perform and you volunteer to perform them. So these schedules of reinforcement belong to operant conditioning. And the other word you have is interval. That has to do with time. So here we go. If we have a fixed interval of reinforcement, that means you get rewarded over a certain amount of time always. Think about a paycheck. If you get a paycheck every two weeks, that's a fixed interval of reinforcement to reinforce you to keep working at your job. Fixed ratio. Let's imagine you work at an apple orchard and every time you pick one basket of apples, you get $4. That would be fixed ratio because for a fixed number of efforts, you get a reward. Your card at Starbucks, that's a fixed ratio. Every time you order a certain number of cups of coffee or whatever and get your card punched, then you'll get your free cup of coffee, fixed ratio. Variable interval, you never know when it's gonna happen, variable interval. So for example, you never know if you're a surfer when a wave will come in but you wait for that wave to get the reward and you wait and you wait. You're a fisherman, you cast your line into the water and you wait and eventually, hopefully, you get rewarded when a fish bites. So a variable interval is unpredictable. Variable ratio, that's the most powerful type of reinforcement. You never know when you're gonna get rewarded so you keep trying and trying. Let's go back to the little kid in the grocery cart yelling for candy. Mom caves one day. The next day, she's like, no, you, you really don't need that. And the kid cries and yells, and mom just puts up with it. And then a third time, and mom puts up with it. And then a fourth time, and then a fifth time. The fifth time, she caves in. All right, I'll get you the candy. The kid has learned that it might not work one time, but maybe it'll work the next time. So with your variable ratio, it's human nature to keep trying and trying. And guess what? Gambling. Gambling is so, so very hard to break because you never know when you're gonna get rewarded and you keep trying for that next time. Very powerful. All right, I'm gonna conclude because it's already nine minutes and this is a long video and I hope this helps and study and good luck on your test.